we uh, talk about education on the program quite frequently, and I have a lot of people guests that come. Um, I take issue with the last statement. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a function of poverty, and I've got to rebut. I, I, I feel compelled to rebut that. Anytime we take a sociological situation and say that until we get people out of poverty, there are people that are millionaires that commit incest, that abuse their spouses, that commit murder. And I take issue with trying to, to say that the remedy is lifting them out of poverty. Our families, my wife and I both came from poverty. And bless God, we had families, we had parents that invested in our lives with principles for God, family, and country. And that, you know, are, those are conservative values that we need to impart and we need to tell everybody about because it's not a function of money. It's a function of we have turned our back on an almighty God and we need to come back. Education. We talk about it quite a bit on the show, and our liberal friends, I think the governor is touring the state now asking for more money. President Obama's own education department uh, recently released a study, and I believe it was from 1980 to 2010, basically 30 years. We've doubled the amount of money in real dollars, today's dollars, in education, and added 3 million new teachers, and yet our test scores are flat. So is it time, and Mr. You may want to eliminate another uh, program, but <laughs> you're, you're going to kick it off for us here, Mr. Holman. I, the delivery system, is it time we explore maybe another delivery system for education in this country? Well, every governor in America wants to be known as the education governor, and I think it's time that they take up that responsibility. <laughs> we can get rid of the department, the Federal Department of Education, but we don't need, need 8,000 bureaucrats in Washington hoovering up our dollars from the states sifting it through some bureaucrats, sending it back to the states, a part of it with a bunch of strings attached. You know, our states can educate our children. You know, our founding fathers loved education. They founded great universities, but they didn't put it in the Constitution. They could never have imagined that the federal government would be telling us how to educate our children. I think it's pretty simple. Send it back to the states, let the states handle it. I get the unique responsibility of dealing with funding for the schools on a pretty regular basis. This week I met with the school board uh, about some of their funding requests. Uh, one of the things I've learned uh, in my time dealing with the school board and with the county commission and funding is that uh, to some people you can never throw enough money at the problem. Uh, and the truth of the matter is we've gotten away from real education in this country and we need to, we need to go back. Uh, bring it down to state levels, and actually let different states work in the ways that they see important, and let them be laboratories for success. I would also agree, actually I would echo what uh, both uh, George and Paul had to say, but in addition to that, we also need to look at ways of empowering states to take, more, to take better control of the funding because the unions and special interests are taking the dollars that should be going into the classroom. So yes, the states need to capture that. The federal government doesn't need to be in that business, but we also need to look at innovative ways to help aid the states in getting better control of the fiscal responsibility with the dollars allocated for the schools. Education is a fine thing, but how do you force it on people who don't value it, who don't want to utilize it? What do you do with these people? You can offer it, but if they flat out refuse to work, if they flat out refuse to go to school or support their kids going to school, and they sit there with their hands out, what do we do with these same people? I believe that's 
to me, is it not? I'm sorry, Mr. Cole. Okay. Um, Sometimes I think I'm the candidate. I get all excited. Well, you don't come up and answer the question. <laughs> um, look, the, uh, in this country, we seem to have set a single path for our educational system. We've decided that everybody has to go to college. Everybody's not going to go to college. What they need in education. That's one thing we looked at this week with the school board was creating a new school where we would teach a trade. Whoa! A I'm sorry, I'm old enough to remember when you had shop. Yeah. Uh, in school. Uh, when you learned how to repair a, a car. Yeah. Uh, we need to, to show people that there are other ways to be successful in the economy. And we need to educate them to that. Not everybody either wants to go to college or can go to college. There needs to be another way to do it. And we need to get those people involved in it. The other thing we need to do, Carmen, is we need to convince people that it makes a whole lot more sense to be involved in the economy than to be involved in taking from the government. And one of the ways to do that is we need to limit how much someone can take and how long they can take. I follow the premise that the word says, uh, if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I think that was just well put, uh, what Paul Cole said, because everyone should not be measured successful or unsuccessful based on a degree. You have skills that can be learned and acquired with, uh, you know, through trade and what have you. And I think we need to do all of the things that will facilitate that. So I, I'm a proponent of that way. Hey, Bill and Paul have said some good things, but let's not forget you know, what's at root of a lot of the problems that our youth are having. That's the moral decline in this country. The moral decline and the disintegration of the family. You know, the statistics of children who are born out of wedlock, who grow up in poverty, and who never have a chance to succeed, it you know, all goes back to that moral decline and the decline and the disintegration of the family. And we're fortunate on May 8th, we're going to have a chance to tell people around the nation that in North Carolina, you know, we respect families because marriage is between a man and a woman. Agenda 21. I've heard a lot about it. Uh, we've talked about it and it uh, learned an awful lot about Agenda 21. In fact, the Wake County Board of Commissioners, Mr. Cole was quite aware of this, uh, they stepped up and tabled uh, the Wake County Sustainability Task Force on that issue. It's been around for a long time. The, uh, for those who may not know about Agenda 21, let me ask you, Mr. Randall, what's so bad about Agenda 21? It, it fits the template of socialism, where Margaret Thatcher said, the problem with socialism is that eventually they run out of other people's money. But Agenda 21 is even more insidious. Not only is it a threat to our economy, but the government taking control and actually figuring out winners and losers, it'll, it'll actually dictate everything we do. It is to put us under the umbrella of world authority and take away the autonomy of the United States of America. We cannot allow the insidious Agenda 21 to come in. I uh, actually commend and applaud the uh, actions taken by the commissioners to, to at least put a halt to it right now, but we're, we're going to have to be on guard because they're going to try and come from every direction to bring it in and make inroads. So Agenda 21 is something that we must uh, avoid, we must not embrace it because all it is is a Trojan horse because once we let it come in, we're done for. Yeah. Now, Agenda 21, like all the other plans that politicians and bureaucrats have to slowly take away our freedoms, take away the power that we have to control our own fate, our own destiny, our own property rights, is like carbon monoxide. And you never smell it. You don't see it until it's too late. And then it's got you. And I'm glad, Paul, I commend you for taking us down on Agenda 21. The, uh, and we all have to be vigilant 
vigilant at every turn against any encroachment on our freedoms and our rights. Thirty seconds to explain Agenda 21. Uh, okay, collectivism versus personal property rights. That's what it boils down to. So let me take the rest of my time and just say that I was Joe and Tony and. Uh, Phil and I were told that Agenda 21 in the UN program did exist. Well, if it did exist, why did the state of Tennessee and the state of Texas have resolutions in their legislatures against it? And why have 41 counties in this country not only disassociated themselves with ICLEI, but also withdrawn from those programs and quit paying them dues? It is real, it is live, and if we don't do something, we will lose our rights. I don't know if you've heard, but um, Dorothea Dix is shutting down. I know, shocking. Um, they want to turn it into a tourist park because people are going to travel from all over the world to come here and see this tourist park. <laughs> Maybe they'll find a god or five. Um, there are those who say we have to get out of the business. We're a bankrupt, we're, we're virgin on bankruptcy if we're not already. I think we are, but that's just me. We don't have the money to keep it up. We don't have the money to, to renovate it. We're going to try to part and parcel it out, find homes for these people. There are others who say if you do this, you compromise the safety of the citizens, you compromise the economic well being of the citizens when you have an element out on the street that doesn't need to be on the street. So where do you fall? Where's the cutoff line, in your opinion, when it comes to programs, social programs, which I consider this to be, like Dorothea Dix, where's your, where is your cutoff line? In the sense that, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I feel like Casey's presence is hanging over my shoulder. It's like, what are you talking about? I guess what I mean is, we don't like entitlements, but we have to take care of the populace. Where is that line? And you can use Dorothea, Dorothea Dix as a, as a, whatever that thing would be. <laughs> I mean, Dorothea Dix belongs to the taxpayers. I mean, it's, it's property of the government, which the government is supposed to work for us. Yeah, it, it would be nice to have a great park with Ferris wheels and those paddle boats and stuff like you have a pulling park or just have it on a bigger level. But it has to be a matter of priorities. You know, is that a priority that we need to be spending our tax dollars on right now in the situation, in the economy that we're in? No, I don't. You know, it could be an incredible source of revenue if we sold it and somebody developed it. You know, that would be great. The, um, it's always a matter of priorities. You know, America, we probably are a bankrupt, but we're still the richest nation in the world. The, um, you know, it's good that we have a safety net for people who are down, down on their luck, you know, had a, a tough turn in life. But it doesn't need to be a safety panic where we make people dependent on the federal government or any government, you know, indefinitely. And you know, as far as a park goes, I mean, that, that just seems to me one of the least things that we need to be concerned about spending you know, our dollars on right now. Uh, I'm sure there's something much better that our tax dollars can go to right now. Real quick, it's unfortunate that we're told we don't have enough money to uh, keep up uh, Dorothy and Dix, but they had enough money to build a new hospital in Butner uh, and, and to leave uh, mental health in, in, North, in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, to be simply a trip from Raleigh to Butner. That's a real problem. Uh, but it comes back to how we deal with the money, and, and what's happening is, is, is the way we ought to deal with Medicaid uh, as to to bring it back to the state and let the state distribute the money locally where it's used, like in the county. We are actually now creating an MCO to deal with mental health. And it does come back to prioritization. We need to make sure with limited dollars that we're taking care of those people who most need the help. And frankly, those with mental illnesses need the help more than a lot of other people. My wife actually works uh, in the mental health uh, field with her profession, 
And one thing we have learned is that many of these social programs are in industry. Until we face the fact that there are people who are gaming the system and are not truly bringing help to those in need, and there are mental, mental health patients that need help, they're in dire need of help, and we should never abandon them. But I think along with this, we need to explore the health services industries to make sure that the public trust has not been violated and people submitting uh, reports and this, that, and the other to justify their existence. We need to take a bottom-up review to make sure that we're not being played in this issue. 